Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to another wrap up. This will probably be wrap up number two you see today because I have a previous one that I filmed last week that I didn't get edited and put out on time. Uh, that's just because this past week was kind of crazy in a good way. Lots of stuff was happening and it was all good, but I just did not get a lot of things done that I thought I was going to. Anyway, in this video, I'm going to wrap up the things that I read for the Women in Translation Readathon, which ran from August 25th to September 2nd. I did a TBR for this, which I did pretty well at. It was also a TBR for the Translateathon Round 2, which was the week after this one. I completely failed at that one, so you won't be seeing a wrap up for that. Um, but that happened exactly at the time when like everything in my life kind of exploded and there was everything going on and I didn't have the brain space to read a lot. Um, so I kind of am sad that I didn't read much for Translateathon, but I did quite well for the Women in Translation Readathon. So I'm going to start off with the three short novels that I read for the Women in Translation Readathon. The first one is The Emissary by Yoko Tawada, which in its description sounds quite science fictional. It's set um, some unspecified time in the future, but pretty far in the future, um, when it's clear that human actions have led to pretty much the complete destruction of the world, most animals are dead, clearly there's been major climate change, and something has pushed Japan like physically away from the mainland, and I didn't completely understand what was going on sometimes. But I feel like this story was inspired by Tawada reading about all of the potential theories for things that could go bad that are in the headlines right now, and then just said, well, what if all of these things happen and the world is completely flipped on its head and everything that we once held true is completely the opposite now? What would that be like? So really, this is about um, a man taking care of his great-grandson. The man is like 105 years old or something, but um, like many people of his generation, he just keeps going. The old people in this world um, are essentially immortal, and they're going to be taking care of the world and the next generations forever. But young people, people boy being born now, um, are very ill. They've been very affected by what's happened to the world, and many of them don't live very long. So this is part of that reversal, which is we expect to, uh, you know, essentially give the planet to our children, that the old people will die, the young people will inherit the earth. In, in this one, though, what you expect is just not what's true anymore. And I found that reversal to be interesting. You know, what kind of world is it where just literally everything that you once thought was true that was always going to be true just isn't anymore? I was very into essentially the world building and most of this. I was wondering what had happened and what the world was actually like. And then it was so disappointing because it ended right when the plot was about to begin. I was really disappointed. I gave the book two stars. I was that disappointed. It, it was actually written quite well. I enjoyed it on like a sentence level and with the descriptions, but essentially all it is is a string of descriptions. And then it ends. I was not happy. I'm not sure if I will try reading anything else by Tawada because I'm now two for two on books that I just didn't get or was irritated by. Next up is Tainarun, Mail from Another City by Lena Kron. This is essentially an epistolary short novel. It's letters that a woman writes to her unnamed lover uh, after she emigrates to a city of insects. And I have to say that for most of this, I did not get what it was about. I just really enjoyed the writing. Like all of the novels that I read for this readathon, there really isn't a plot. It's just essentially a lot of descriptions and internal monologue and feelings and such. But it was beautiful. It was really beautiful. I'm not necessarily a huge fan of epistolary novels. Some I've read I've really loved, but this is I think actually in that category where I'm like, I don't quite get why this has to be in letter format, especially because it's not fully embracing the letter format. 
um, but that was okay. Mainly I was just incredibly taken with the language. Um, I guess Kron is also a poet and this certainly reads like it, so I was very immersed in the beauty of what was being said. And then I feel kind of bad because I wasn't paying that much attention. I completely missed until the end that this whole story is basically about change, about metamorphosis. And I can't really speak that well about it because I wasn't paying attention. I didn't get it until I was done. And I think I missed a lot because of that. So I wish I had something more intelligent to say about this one, but um, I liked it and I should reread it someday. That's basically what it boils down to. The next book that I read is The Summer Book by Tova Janssen. This is another one that doesn't really have an overarching plot, though it has many episodes. It's very episodic, these little stories strung together, and I quite enjoyed that. So from what I gather from the introduction of the edition that I read, um, Janssen wrote this book in the 1970s after the death of her own mother when she was very affected by it. And it's easy to miss in the story, but it was pointed out in the introduction, so I got it this time, um, that this is a story about a young girl who's lost her mother. And Sophia spends a lot of time with her grandmother. Her family spends the summers on this very isolated little island in the Gulf of Finland. And it's really just the things that um, Sophia does um, especially with her uh, very old grandmother. So it's like this six-year-old girl and an 85-year-old woman, um, you know, traipsing around the island or going to other islands. And the thing that tickled me the most about the story was that basically the grandmother behaves the same way that the six-year-old girl does. <laughs> um, they're so similar in, in so many ways and that probably means they bounce off of each other a little bit, but it was, I think it was such an accurate representation of people of these ages. Uh, both of them are a little bit petulant sometimes. Both of them just want to do their thing and they don't want other people to get in the way. And they escape into the same kind of fantasies and flights of imagination. They both literally go away to escape people and build fortresses and have their private places and don't want to be with other people. And then, I don't know, it was really good. And hanging over the entire thing, I think, is that sense of loss. There's something a bit off and that's that somebody's missing. Um, I do think that the story didn't resonate as much with me as it could have because I just didn't read it in a mood where this type of story would really sink in and, and get its claws into me, you know? Um, so it was very good. I just think that some of the emotional content of it didn't really affect me the way um, it would have in a different mood, but I definitely enjoyed it. And I would like to read more of Janssen's adult fiction, because previously I'd only read four of the Moomin family books. There, there are similarities, though. The way that, you know, things that people do on their little islands, and the way that they behave and talk, and the family dynamics um, in the summer book totally reminded me of some elements of the Moomin family adventures. Um, but I think I would really enjoy Janssen's adult fiction as well as her children's fiction, so I'm gonna go try and find more of that. And the last thing, let me put my hot chocolate away, the last thing that I read for the Women in Translation readathon, I began my reread of the Fruits Basket manga series by Natsuki Takaya. Um, I forgot the translators of the previous books, I'm sorry for not mentioning them, but this series is translated into English by um, Alethea and um, Athena Nibley. So I'm contemplating actually doing a separate video on this series when I finished my reread. I probably will have enough to say about the whole thing and, you know, there are 23 volumes. I'm not going to talk about every single one of them individually. So yeah, I think I will do that. What I will say now, this is the story of a teenage girl named Toru Honda who is invited to live with some members of the Soma family and she discovers accidentally that they are cursed by the vengeful spirits of the animals from the Zodiac, plus the 13th the cat. 
and she's going to try to break their curse. That's everything in a very tiny nutshell. But this is about a very sweet and well-meaning but kinda dim girl who becomes a very healing influence in the lives of the cursed members of this family, many of whom are suffering from like extreme emotional, psychological, and physical abuse as a result of the family dynamics from their curse and the fact that the head of the family, Akito, is a horrible person. Frankly, I'd forgotten how lighthearted and fun and comedic the series starts out as. It really plays up the humor of uh, the fact that Toro accidentally hugs a lot of the members of the family and they turn into their Zodiac members when they are ill or very stressed or hugged by a member of the opposite sex. Um, so there's just a lot of comedy and kind of screwball stuff in the beginning. But in retrospect, it's a lot easier to pick up on the clues very, very early on that something more sinister is going on, that there's an actual mysterious secret that's not good at the heart of the Soma family's curse. Like, it's a curse for a reason. It's not just fun times, you know? Um, it's not just about the cute animals. So, I really enjoyed it. I was astonished at how much of this I still remembered, but I have reread the first half of this series multiple times, and I watched the um, anime version multiple times as well. And like, I had dialogue memorized. I remembered entire panels. It was great. It was a real trip down memory lane in some ways, um, because I also associate this manga with some really great times in my life, so that's good as well. Um, but I think I will leave other thoughts on Fruits Basket for a more complete video about the series. I feel a bit strange talking about manga here because it's not something that I read anymore, but I went through a huge manga phase when I was a teenager, and this series is the only one that I kept the entire series. It's one of the only like two or three that I read to completion. Um, and it just stands out as like the best manga I ever read. <laughs> I bounced really hard off of a lot of others and I tried a lot of them. Um, so don't expect me to be talking about manga a lot. This one is kind of um, the odd one out, I guess, in my life now. So anyway, that was the Women in Translation readathon. I had a lot of fun reading everything for this. Even the emissary, as much as it irritated me, I'm glad I read it. Um, so that's it for this video. Let me know if you have read any of these, if you have thoughts on them as well. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I will be back again soon, and until then, bye.